In our last session, we discussed in some detail how to construct a floating point number starting with a decimal number. In this section, we're going to try it. We're going to take the number pi and convert it to floating point. And I hope through that, uh, maybe some of the fog of the last section will get straightened out through this example. So let's do that. We'll take the number pi and, as our goal, create a floating point representation using our single precision real notation. Uh, so we need to represent pi somehow. Let's go to our calculator and see what it says. Uh, most of your calculators will return 3.14159265.4. Now we know that pi is irrational and that is not exactly equal to pi, but if you use that value for most applications you'd probably be okay with the precision. And so we're going to try to store that. Uh, what you'll find is kind of interesting is we will only partially succeed at storing that number turns out that the representation you're looking at now is too precise for single precision to be able to manage and we'll have to live with truncating off some digits to the right. We're not going to be happy about that. As we move to the next session, we will figure out how to solve that problem as well. Okay, well let's go through the process. Uh, first we need to note if it's a positive or negative number. Well, that's, that's positive. And that means the first bit that we store, that sign bit, will be set to zero. Uh, then the next step will be to break that number, pi, into its whole portion and fractional portion. And we're dropping the decimal point now, not forgetting that there's really a decimal point separating them, but we're going to manage these two numbers as integers and then put them back together as a binary number. Well, it would be easiest if we started with octal. That's kind of a big number to the right, a lot of work. I think I'd rather use octal to do that. The 3 isn't going to be very tough at all because 3 in base 10 is 3 in base 8, so there's nothing much for us to do there. Uh, the real work comes from the other portion or the fractional portion. Now we already know how to do that from two sessions ago. Uh, we set up a series of divisions by 8, uh, computing the whole number in the division, in other words the truncated portion of the division, and we would take the remainder and record it off to the right. And we kept taking this truncated version and repeating the process dividing by 8, uh, keeping the whole portion and recording the remainder. And as we did that all the way down until we got a zero whole, whole portion, we then took the numbers in reverse order, or I might say the most significant order first, and we created an octal number out of that. Now, I didn't mention last time why we go in reverse order. I might as well do that now. If you think about it, each successive whole number that we're dividing is more and more significant. Uh, you have to take this number times 8 to whatever power was needed uh, to undo all this division we've done. And so really we should read that from left to right. And that's why we build from the bottom up. It's in the direction of most significant to least significant, and that forms our octal number. Okay, now that we've converted this decimal uh, fractional portion of pi to its equivalent octal portion, we now need to get it into binary. Well, fortunately, that's not so hard. We can use that column by column approach uh, using this table that we saw earlier to simply break up every octal digit into groups of three binary digits. And we've already seen how to do that. You can check that and do that later. Okay, the next step is to go back and retrieve our whole portion, that was the three whole number, but to retrieve it in the binary format. So that is a 0, 1, 1. We take the old decimal point that we had before and now call it a binary point, and we copy the balance of this binary number corresponding to the fractional portion of pi to the right of this binary point. Now, what is the next job we're supposed to do? Well, uh, just like scientific notation, floating point notation requires us to move the binary point until we get a 1 in the units position. Here it is down here. I've put it next to this leading 1 to guarantee that I have a 1 in the units place. 
Now this is ready to be used as a mantissa, almost. Uh, what we want to store is everything except that leading one. Therefore, we will store everything past this binary point as a binary integer into what we now call the mantissa. The exponent must be one because we shifted the binary point by one and we keep track of that by adding one to the exponent. Keep in mind since this is a binary number, this exponent is no longer 10 to the first power as it would have been in scientific notation, but it's two to the first power. So this is representing now a number, a mantissa, with this hidden bit uh, times two to the first power. As I look at that mantissa, I realize I have a problem. I have converted dutifully all of my digits, but I ended up with an awful lot more than 23 bits. So I just can't do that. I'm going to have to reduce this to 23, and that means cutting them off to the right. So these grayed bits here are not going to get stored. Instead, we'll have these eight, and these eight giving us 16, and seven more gives us our total 23 bits we can store in the mantissa, and that's the number we'll get. Now, when we pull that number back out and convert it back to decimal, uh, you're not going to get that full pi value that we tried to stick in there. You'll only get seven significant digits. Now, secondly, our exponent, we can't store a one directly because this is an offset number. The exponent needs to be offset by 127, meaning that we need to add 127 to the number one to guarantee that it will be shown as a positive number. So let's do that. We're going to shift the exponent, or add, same thing in binary, uh, by 127, giving us a value of 128 that we need to store. If we converted 128 to binary, we would end up with one followed with seven zeros. We have the number 128 being stored as the exponent, and then we have the remaining 23 that will fit into the mantissa, losing some, unfortunately, retaining uh, seven decimal significant digits in that number. If we put the thing together, this is really what it would look like in memory. You would have these four bytes with the, that arrangement of ones and zeros uh, that you would actually store. Okay, so I think we have now wrapped up everything we're going to say about constructing and storing and retrieving floating point numbers. Uh, next time we're going to talk about some anomalies of them, things that we're going to have to be careful with as we start doing arithmetic and very shortly numerical algorithms uh, using this representation of numbers. We'll see you next time.